going to start with um, should policy aim to increase labor supply for older workers? Often that's taken as a given. Um, but I want to ask whether we should take it as a given how this gets prioritized with other things we'd want to do and then the implications of how to answer this question um, for policy. Um, then not completely connected, um, but partially connected, want to talk about the growth slowdown, a little bit of a longer perspective on um, labor force participation, um, and then a brief look at the pandemic. So I think we're all familiar with lots of different ways to frame and phrase the importance of um, working longer. Um, Bronstein et al., a paper that included John Chauvin, has just a lot of really great illustrations of, for example, increasing retirement saving by one percentage point for 10 years is the same as working um, one or two months longer. They also have something like working three to six months longer is the equivalent of having made 1% more um, over your entire career. So there's a set of powerful examples and illustrations of the power of working longer. There's also a whole macroeconomic discussion that I'm going to circle back to and discuss in greater detail. But people who worry about the disappointing slowdown in growth from, say, 3.5% from 1950 to 2005 to 1.7%, a lot of that is them worrying about demographics. And if you assign an economist the task of solving that problem, I mean, you can't get all the way back to 3.5, an important part of the solution probably is going to be increased work by um, older workers. This is a sort of individual story and a macro story here. Um, there also seems to be a, um, a deadweight loss story here, a standard sort of government failure story of um, someone that was told for a long time, but one of the most recent careful quantifications of it was from Aragak Kotlikoff using their fiscal analysis model. Um, and they talk about the incentive of boomers to earn more is significantly limited by a plethora of explicit federal and state taxes, implicit taxes, um, loss of federal and local benefits. A particular concern is Medicaid and Social Security. Um, and they document lifetime tax rates for older people of 35 to 55%. Um, percent. And of course, we know that means it's not just that in the interest of growth, we're taking people who really hate the idea of working and like forcing them back into the factories, um, but we're taking people whose benefit um, from working is measured by you know, what they're producing, the social benefit of their working measured by what they're producing, measured by their marginal product is higher than what they're actually receiving um, right now. And as a result, they're making a social mistake um, by not working, a social mistake because of um, that tax wedge. Now, the types of policies um, people have proposed are lowering social security tax rates for older workers, um, increasing the number of years counted towards benefits, crediting um, additional work to benefits in some form, um, allowing Medicare to cover insurance for employed older workers and letting companies basically drop them um, from insurance, raising the age limit for the EITC. There's probably a couple others as well. Um, and all of these are in the vein of reducing that tax wedge, which discourages um, older workers, leads to suboptimal work, leads to worse retirement and lower um, economic growth. So I think so far, this is like the relatively standard story um, that people tell. And now, um, and I sort of almost had written on these slides and then started to ask, you know, these are two separate questions. Um, one is what's the best way to achieve the goal of getting people to work longer? And that takes the goal as given. The second is does getting people to work longer pass a cost benefit test? And that's essentially comparing this issue to a set of other issues. I mean, you see this type of thing all the time. Jim and I have been in rooms where people were talking about corporate tax reform and their basic goal was to have the deadweight loss of the corporate tax system equal to zero, which if your only goal is corporate tax, that makes sense. But if in doing that, you're raising other distortionary taxes, you haven't necessarily reduced deadweight loss in the system as a whole. And to some degree, what you want is the distortions in the corporate system to be no worse 
um, than the distortions um, elsewhere. Um, you get that sometimes in discussions of, you know, where there might be two rooms. One room is discussing retirement security, and it's about how people should save more. And another room is discussing how the middle class is getting squeezed, and it's about how they should have more um, consumption over the course of their life. And those two end up being in tension with each other. And so the Auerbach and Kotlikoff paper didn't have uh, didn't have marginal tax rates for any younger workers on uh, the 2017 paper uh, that I just showed you. So I said, oh, you know, I want to find those because to some degree the answer to the question of how much should we be worrying about this particular um, tax wedge is to some degree the question of what do the tax rates look like um, for under younger workers. Uh, well, their paper didn't have it, but they have a 2020 um, NBER paper that I don't think has been uh, published and endorsed in full by the NBER, which is how the papers work, as I understand it, according to the newspapers, Joe. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, well, okay, I had no idea that they weren't all true. Um, uh, so they have a 2020 paper uh, with David Altick, different set of co-authors, David Altick, um, among others. And this is their median lifetime marginal tax rate for someone in the middle resource um, quintile. They're trying to do all in. They're looking at all taxes. They're looking at all benefits. They're measuring it in a present value lifetime way. Um, there's a lot of sort of black box, or maybe maybe it's all transparently documented somewhere. Um, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of assumptions um, that went into this. So I wouldn't sort of go out there and state with confidence that this is right. Um, but this picture doesn't um, scream out at you that there's some big distortion for older workers relative to what we already have um, for younger workers. Um, and it certainly doesn't scream out for you that you want to lower um, the marginal tax rate for older workers if that meant sort of holding everything else equal, um, effectively raising it for others um, um, and, and the like. This is the middle quintile at older ages. Um, this just shows their results for the lowest middle top and top um, 1%. It's the median lifetime marginal tax rate. Um, there's enormous variation, as we all know, um, within all of these. Um, I couldn't quite tell what was going on, but part of what I think was going on was at younger ages, um, you had uh, certainly lower incomes, more people, for example, having phase outs of benefits that like the earned income tax credit or on the child tax credit. I wasn't quite sure why for the top quintile, um, except that for them, the social security taxes in some sense are always distortionary in that you're getting a very low return on them and you're effectively paying um, in present value the full social security tax if you're in the top 1%, whether you're age 20 or age um, 70. So that was my guess here, was there's a set of benefit uh, programs that are phasing out for lower income and for higher income um, the not getting a return on your social security um, doesn't really matter. Um, but you can look in the last two categories. I just did 60 and 69 and 70 to 79 minus the more uh, prime age work. It's relatively small and there's not you know, that, that much um, of a pattern. Um, now, the only people that could make decisions based on this are people who like maybe like Larry Kotlikoff might be the only one who would understand every aspect of the economy well enough um, to make his labor supply decisions on uh, lifetime marginal tax rates. Um, the bottom here is current year marginal tax rates. These again have a lot of stuff that's not necessarily overly visible to people as benefits phase out um, and the like, but at least it's a little bit more plausible that you sort of talk to your neighbor learn that they made more, they got less EITC than you, paid more in taxes than you, or whatever else. And the current year, which might be more behaviorally relevant, don't you know, exhibit um, a particularly strong um, pattern. Um, if anything, you know, if you start to think about how actual humans think about this, rather than what the model would say, um, you might wanna raise the tax rates, especially for the lowest and middle income quintiles for younger workers, 
because those are the ones where the social security payroll tax, the 12.4, is essentially entering as something close to zero um, in certainly the lifetime marginal tax rates in their analysis, but where a person might think that they're actually paying uh, 12.4 or maybe just 6.2 in payroll taxes. So there are other considerations here, um, of course. Um, there's the classic um, Atkinson Stiglitz taxing things with that are less elastic at um, higher rates uh, that are more inelastic. I, I, okay, I said it correctly both times that are more inelastic at higher rates. And certainly you have more elastic labor supply um, for older workers. They're sort of not sure whether they're going to work or not. Somebody at age 40 is going to work no matter what. So why not tax the person at 40 more heavily um, than the older worker? Um, there's another one which goes, I think, the other way, which is I'm very worried about a 40-year-old who drops out of the labor force for a year. The implications that has for their earnings 10, 20 years in the future, the probability that they're working 10 or 20 years um, in the future. And so in some sense, there's a larger present value cost of discouraging someone, a 40 year old from working than there is a 65 year old where, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, in year 10 and 20 of the present value calculation, um, there's not a whole lot of mass and earnings um, and the like. And so this says to me, you know, maybe you want a relentless all in effort on people that, you know, Catherine is one of the people in this room that's worked on, on all the different, every age group, um, labor supply and more of a work on that. Um, then there's a last consideration, which is sort of paternalism, which might be that you think people misoptimize and, you know, then trying to understand how they misoptimize is quite important. I think the view 20 years ago and still the popular view is that people had a lower living standard um, in retirement. They were less happy um, in retirement. So they're making a mistake by retiring early. And maybe we wanted something to sort of discourage them um, from making that type of mistake. Um, sort of endless debates in the retirement adequacy um, literature, but I read it at this point is much, much more sort of mixed to neutral um, to possibly people even have sort of a better living standard when you adjust for like them cooking their own meals and the way they actually um, consume and the way their leisure complements their consumption um, in retirement. And so maybe there isn't quite the same you know, paternalism problem that we wanna solve about somebody in their working age um, versus um, their older age. Um, for younger workers, there's a whole nother set of considerations. They're another group that's quite elastic um, for them, though, sometimes the choice is between school and work. And so what, how you think about the present value of that choice is, um, is to me unsure. So I don't leave all of this discussion saying, you know, it's a mistake uh, to focus on marginal tax rates for older workers, but, um, but I do leave it a little bit less sure than I was uh, before I pulled the numbers um, for younger ages and started thinking about how it all compared and thinking that maybe one needed to think uh, you know, more carefully as to why uh, the focus was on this, which of these or other justifications um, for it. Um, now, everything I've showed you is for the United States. Um, this is the famous uh, Gruber, uh, Millig Milligan and Wise uh, graph, which shows tax force to retire and, um, and the number of men who are retired. Um, and you can see the United States is towards the bottom of the tax force. So it might be if you looked at that graph of marginal tax rates by age across a wider range of countries, um, you would see in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Italy. And some of these countries have changed their systems um, since then and have reduced them. Um, but you would maybe see something more like the story that we're actually making a mistake by taxing this group, and in particular, this more elastic group more heavily than we are um, other ones. And just another way of showing these data, 
um, the United States is um, towards the very high end of the employment population ratio. The bars are for 2017. There happen to be dots um, for 2007. And this is, you know, as much as possible um, age adjusted. So it holds fixed the age distribution uh, across the different countries. So you have New Zealand and Korea higher than the United States, um, but the United States really is um, higher. So, you know, part of where this led me was thinking rather than your sort of normal, everything's a disaster in the United States, everything's horrible, let's have a conference to figure out how to fix it, um, that maybe uh, this is about how the United States roughly got this right. Um, by having the same tax rates across different age groups and, you know, what it is we can teach um, the rest of the world, at least the rest of the world, um, excluding New Zealand and Korea. Now, none of this speaks to policies that don't cost money or even save money. Um, this was about sort of starting the presumption that you want the same marginal tax rate on different ages and different types of activities that you wanted a neutral tax system. Um, there's other things like eliminating the retirement earnings test after the normal um, retirement age that is less about money and more about um, optics and optics that matter a lot to people. Um, raising the earliest eligibility age or the normal retirement age, which uh, the second obviously operating through the signal value that's associated with it. Um, and whether there's other policies um, to support and encourage um, older workers and thinking sort of more about these rather than the marginal tax rate ones. Um, the other issue with the marginal tax rate ones, which is not just the abstract, you want an optimal tax system to be effectively equally distortionary um, across everything, is um, that we just don't have a lot of money um, right now we're on sort of the wrong side of where we should be um, in terms of tax revenue. And so, yes, maybe if you did social security reform that restored solvency and lowered the payroll tax rate for older workers, that might be an optimal social security reform. Um, but even getting that reform done um, is gonna be quite hard. And even within that reform, um, if you care about, for example, benefit levels, uh, <clears throat> you get trade-offs there. I just want to put a brief plug in, and I think it sort of gets at this distortion and how distortions might be different for older workers um, and younger workers for one um, policy that isn't usually as much part of the older worker conversation. It's usually in a set of other conversations, um, and that's wage insurance. Um, you can motivate wage insurance by saying that unemployment insurance creates a distortion. Um, if you choose to not work and make zero, you get half of your old earnings. But if you choose to take a job at a lower wage, you don't uh, get anything. Um, you don't get any form of insurance. And this can discourage you from taking a job at a lower wage. Um, this distortion is probably more serious for um, older workers because they're the ones who are more likely um, to only have a new job opportunity at a lower wage, either because of the trajectory of where they are um, in terms of skills because of the health costs associated with them. Refer back to my point um, about Medicare, maybe even just because of, of some unfair form of age discrimination. And so I think the case for wage insurance for older workers, say 55 and up, you take a job at a lower wage after you involuntarily lost your job and it makes up half of the difference in your earnings and that's paid out over say five years as a way to keep people in the labor force and address this distortion. I should have said the distortion for unemployment insurance also might be more serious because this might be an age where you're making a decision about whether to exit uh, the labor force or not exit the labor force. And so I'm not saying this is like the most important policy, but insofar as you haven't already had three papers on it, maybe it should have like one part of one paper. It's not too late. So now I'm going to turn to a topic that in some ways is related um, to what I just said, and in some ways not related um, to what I just said, which is the slowdown in economic growth. I showed you the slowdown before. Um, before talking about it, it is worth thinking seriously about why we care about economic growth and how we measure the value of economic growth. Um, in macro, if somebody takes a job making $60,000, GDP goes up by $60,000, and we count that 
is economic growth. Um, in micro, um, if somebody takes a job making $60,000, then we say welfare goes up by $60,000 uh, minus the loss of their leisure. Um, now, I've never been completely comfortable with the micro model for, say, you know, a 40-year-old without children. Um, for me, rather than work being disutility or losing leisure, so reducing the utility you get from leisure, um, work to me seemed like a connection to a community, um, a positive thing, and to the degree that non-work was addictive, you could sort of make a bad choice today that um, would would hurt you and compound down. So you know, when I think of, you know, we're in a recession and the Fed creates jobs, um, I don't think to myself, isn't it sad all the leisure we've lost? I think, look at all the jobs we've gained and I measure them roughly at the value that people were um, paid. Um, when it comes to older workers though, um, the micro perspective has a little bit uh, more appeal. I mean, it depends on the age, but you know, people talk about older workers leaving the labor force because of COVID. I don't have some prior view as to what the right labor force participation is for 75 year olds. I don't certainly shouldn't be 100, shouldn't be zero. Uh, maybe you could say it's whatever it would be without the distortions um, that we have. But if a 75 year old discovered during COVID that there were more fun things for them uh, than they had realized in terms of spending time with their grandchildren or they learned to play golf because that was a safe outdoor activity. And then they didn't go back to work um, when the pandemic cooled down. Um, I'm a little bit closer to the micro view on that of sort of revealed preference, the value of their leisure, and that we shouldn't think about the sort of growth that comes from older workers as having quite the same value. Um, even if you, know, you take a 40 year old that gets a job at 60,000, or 75-year-old that gets a job at 60,000. The 40-year-old, I'm almost comfortable counting that as a $60,000 gain. The 75-year-old, I'm more comfortable counting it as like a $10,000 gain. Um, the difference between you know, what they were being paid and the value to them of time with grandchildren and golf. Um, again, I'm not sort of, this isn't like a deep conviction I have. I'm sort of confused about how we go back and forth between deciding whether work is good or not in other discussions, if you talk about the EITC and it encourages people to work, um, that's good. If you talk about making the child tax credit um, into an allowance and that discourages work, well, that's an income effect, people consuming more time with their children, um, that's good. And so, um, um, you know, we're not, we're not all consistent about this in our heads and I'm trying to be, but unsuccessfully. Um, so I just wanted you to have that in your head when we think about growth coming from this source. Um, there's this great American slowdown, um, all these different articles about the new normal, um, potential dimmed growth was slower. These are all pre-COVID. So I'm trying to sort of assume, look at where we were in 2019 and then extrapolate out on the theory that we're in something relatively similar to that um, now. Um, the new normal, interestingly, sort of was actually fully predictive. Um, people treated growth in the pre-COVID years, like some disappointing surprise. The growth rate in 2019 was 2.3%. If you go back and look at the forecasts that the Social Security Administration and the Congressional Budget Office made, in 1989, the Social Security Administration thought growth in 2019 um, was going to be 1.9%. In 1999, they actually got more pessimistic um, and thought growth that year is going to be 1.4%. And then if you look at CBO just prior to the mm. pandemic, they thought growth um, was going to be, I think, 2.2%. So the slowdown we've seen in growth actually didn't catch the forecasters um, by surprise. Um, it caught them by surprise only insofar as you sort of forgot what you know, Steve Goss knew in 1989, which is there's going to be a lot more older people and older people don't work. Um, as much as younger people. And if anything, growth over the decade before the pandemic was surprisingly good. Um, this is, by the way, even if you include the down of the Great Recession um, and the up. Uh, uh, this just uh, is one, you know, CBO from 1998 looking, and I did this um, two years ago. I'm just showing these slides again um, in case you all missed it or forgot it or weren't present. 
Uh, this was the CBO. Uh, the, the black line is the actual. Um, and the orange line was CBO. And I, it wasn't like an arbitrary cherry pick thing. A lot of forecasts would have told the same story. All the forecasts told the same story. But you look at the forecast, you look at what actually happened um, 20 years later, and reality was better than um, what the forecast said. The forecast was for 2% growth, and the actual was 2.2. Um, then there's that difference in that one year, which is what I showed you before. And this was CBO's forecast. They had this very dismal forecast of 1.8 for potential. I think that's a reasonable reading of potential. Um, but that was even better um, than what they had forecast. And the forecast was based almost entirely on the types of demographic issues that you know, everyone in this room uh, knows really well. Um, and for what it's worth, today we're actually more optimistic about growth. This is the latest um, survey of professional forecasters. Not the latest, but it's the latest one that had 10-year growth estimates. Um, this is where the forecasters think we are on 10-year growth. Um, if you look at the same 10-year window forecast uh, you know, about 20 years ago, all of the forecasts for that same 10-year window that these uh, forecasters are forecasting now were just much, much um, lower. So if anything, the story is a story of a sort of pleasant surprise of 1.8% growth, if that's what you think it's going to be going forward. And by the way, that's where I'd be on these 10-year things, if anyone had asked me. Um, is actually sort of a lot better than um, what we thought before. Um, and why is it so much better? Well, the most important, uh, you don't, you can't read every part of the forecast because they don't forecast every age group's labor force participation and every aspect of productivity um, and the like. But it does look like the main error that forecasters made and the reason the world turned out better than they thought it was, um, was actually labor force participation. Um, so the shift to older workers was the reason for the unsurprising decrease in growth, but it's also the reason for the surprising increase in growth relative to earlier projections that didn't really understand this was happening and didn't um, extrapolate it out. So we've done worse, we knew that, but we've done less worse than we thought. Um, and both of those older workers are playing a really big role in. Um, if you wanna understand potential going forward, understanding you know, how much more of a participation increase we can expect for older workers is incredibly important. And I'm hoping um, in the question period, someone can tell me. Um, and this is just the picture I think we've roughly seen the actual labor force participation was just falling and falling and falling for this group. Um, and then it turned around. Um, if you do age adjusted, that's just using the 2019 population shares and applying those to the participation rates um, going back to 1968, I think. Uh, or maybe 64 to 64, um, you get the picture looks um, very similar. So it's sort of an amazing turnaround and an amazing increase. And basically at every point, forecasts implicitly seem to assume that was going to stop, flatten out, and maybe even mean revert um, and go down. Um, and I should say part of this is when I was at um, CEA, um, we got, there were tons of articles speculating about why labor force participation and say 2014, 2015 were so low were so disappointing, were so terrible. Um, I went back and looked at forecasts from eight years before, and we were actually ahead of what those forecasts thought. We were ahead, again, entirely um, because of this. And um, that's not to say, by the way, it wasn't disappointing. I think it was. I think it was because of prime age workers. Um, so I, that's not sort of a defense of the Obama economic record, um, but just an observation about this. Um, I think we all know the participation for every age group, for women, um, for men, uh, you know, I've learned from you um, why this is shift to less physically demanding jobs, increased education and lifespan, spouses working and the complementarity of work, um, elimination of the early retirement earnings test, and the increase, maybe just a social institutional change of partial retirement and of um, unretirement. Uh, going back to the picture I had before, um, labor force participation on the mm -hmm. x-axis here is 2007 on the y-axis is 2017, almost every dot for a country is above the axis. So labor force participation for older workers increased almost everywhere. Um, you can see it increased most um, 
for countries that started with lower labor force participation. And if anything, there seems to be a little bit of convergence. Um, the US increase was among the smallest over this decade, but that's because it started um, the highest and, and countries like, or economies like the Euro area started much lower, had a bigger increase. And so we've seen um, some convergence. Um, if you continue the types of pre-pandemic um, age-specific trends, we see you're going to see labor force participation continue to decline. This is because older workers working more still isn't enough to make up for the larger fraction of them, plus the younger workers um, working less. And this forecast is very similar to CBO and very similar to what you'd get with aging only, since the error for young people and old people um, is roughly offsetting. So my very last thing is just a brief look at the pandemic. And um, I know you took a much longer look at it um, yesterday. So the main thing I wanna do here is just draw some connections and differences between older workers and other age workers and between the United States and um, other countries, just to put that down on the table as food for thought. Um, this is what's happened to the labor force participation rate. Um, it's down um, 1.2 percentage point from where it was prior uh, to the pandemic. Um, 0 0.3 is what you would have predicted just using aging alone. Um, the weird bump in January is BLS updating the population controls, and that's um, COVID deaths showing up all in one month. You want to spread that out over the previous year, um, but we don't know exactly which months to spread it in over the previous year. Um, and you see a distinct contribution outside of aging, both from um, under age 55 and um, over age 55. Um, breaking out the contributions, um, it's just amazingly heterogeneous. It doesn't really lend itself to one story. People tell childcare stories that uh, both in my work with uh, Melissa Kearney and Willie Powell and in Claudia Golden's work don't really hold up um, to the evidence, um, but you see women and men are basically the same. People tell early retirement stories, but you see age 55, the contribution um, is basically the same. 16 to 24 had looked a lot better, um, but it's gotten um, a bit worse um, lately. And you can see all of that um, in this chart where, you know, if anything, the you know, interesting thing to me is at first older workers, which you can see in um, gray, were declining less than many of the other workers, but they've also recovered um, more slowly. And so in some sense, the divergence um, has actually grown um, a little bit. This again does um, age adjustment within each of these three age groups, which tells a little bit of a different story than the one you saw in, for example, the New York Times yesterday, which showed some numbers that were partly um, partly a function of age changes. So trying to understand both the commonalities, but also the differences, the initial experience being less severe, but then the later experience in some ways um, being worse for me is an important part of the story. Um, and just the final point on this is um, the international comparison, um, which is that the United States for older workers is doing a decent amount worse than and this is employment rates um, than all of the other advanced OECD economies. So whatever explanation you have in terms of long COVID or you know changing taste around retirement or whatever else, you want to square that with the fact that COVID has been similar in all of these countries, but the labor pattern um, has been different. Now, I should have shown you the difference in difference between this age group and the other age groups across countries. There, you actually wouldn't see a pattern. Um, if you did this for overall workers, the United States looks a lot like this too. So this may be some, telling us something um, about, for example, employment retention programs versus unemployment insurance. I was a bit skeptical of the important difference between them early on, but I'm increasingly thinking maybe there is, or maybe it tells you something about labor market institutions. But, um, and, and by the way, the other thing to keep in mind is GDP in the US is stronger than almost all of those countries. And the labor market recovery is weaker um, than almost all those countries. The difference is productivity has been higher. I think that less is innovation and more is people running themselves um, ragged here. So just to conclude, um, 
I do think getting older workers to work more is good from a micro perspective and their well-being, good from a macro perspective, but I'm still not exact, I'm less sure about why um, than I was before I started thinking about it for coming in um, to this group. And I think getting the why might focus on which are the right policies and which are the wrong policies. Um, in terms of economic growth, this is profoundly important. Um, in terms of well-being, it may be somewhat less um, important than the aggregate economic growth because of sort of taking into account the value of leisure and taking that more seriously um, for this age group and understanding the pandemic it's good to look at older workers but good to look at how their story has sort of changed and varied over time relative to younger workers and uh, relative to other countries so um, thank you